Welcome to another session of the council. Uh, this has been a while coming. Uh, we are sitting here today with Neil Shah. Uh, Neil, uh, I normally introduce our guests, but uh, I know you do a much better job of introducing yourself. So I'd like to, I'd like you to tell um, our viewers something about yourself. About myself. Huh? Okay. okay. So uh, I guess you'll take right away from the accent that uh, I. Although I'm a very proud Indian and from an Indian family, I, I grew up in the U.S. as a U.S. citizen. And, um, and my, my mother and father had left India in the 1960s and, and settled there. So I was born and raised there. Right. Um, massive, massive lover of sport. More from a, a participation standpoint. I mean, of course, like anybody, I love watching sport. I love um, you know, bantering about especially my favorite football clubs or making fun of my friend's favorite football clubs or my older brother's uh, favorite football club. But um, really my love for sport and my connect with, with sport has always been uh, playing. And um, I kind of, you know, from a spiritual perspective, lose myself when I'm on a football pitch or playing any sort of game. And uh, I've always been a big, big sports lover. And um, yeah, I've been in India about 10 years as well. So uh, feeling very much a part of this country after living in the US for about 30 years. So give us a uh, brief uh, rundown of what it is that you've done professionally in India or even abroad thus far. Okay, sure. I started my career in 2002 with uh, Major League Soccer. So I was working out of the league office in New York City. The right. uh, league was six years old. Uh, it was almost like a startup and right. it was uh, quite an incredible time in my career helping to construct a, a professional league in, in the U.S. Um, in 2007 or 2009, I uh, left MLS. I was the director of fan engagement there for a couple of years, um, right. my, my last few years at MLS. Moved to India, worked with a company called Dentsu. Dentsu is a globally renowned uh, advertising agency. In India at the time, they were getting pretty big into sport and uh, digital marketing, two areas that I knew quite well. So I was heading up sports marketing for Dentsu. Um, eventually joined a company called Libero Sports and helped build Libero Sports, a football consulting company, was there from 2011 to 2016. Um, had an incredible time there and, and then kind of followed my, my heart into uh, becoming a CEO of a professional football club. I think Indeed. playing FIFA growing up or back then Nintendo uh, when I was younger and any football related um, game you all, or football manager, you always dream that one day you can be a CEO of, a, of a, your own sports team. And I, I got that opportunity with thanks to DSK Shivagins and I, I did that for two years. And right. here I am um, right where we are is a global institute of sports business. And it's something that um, and I've been very passionate about sports and education and that um, kind of intertwining of, of how sport, how education can be an access to somebody living their sporting dreams, whether if it's not, if they're not able to do it on the pitch, then hey, why, why not be able to do it off the pitch and be a sporting hero off the pitch? And so GISB is a, really a platform for that and something that I was excited to uh, get to construct with India on track. And, and that's where I am today as the program director of GISB. That's great. We, we will talk more about GISP because it's something that's been close to my heart. Education and sport and just building a workforce that takes sport to the next level in India. So we'll come to that a little later. Uh, but the first question uh, I want to ask you, Neil, is um, do you think India is a nation of sport? Hmm. So I think it's a nation of people who love sport. Um, so I look at sp that question in um, two aspects, or I look at even just this concept of nation of sports. Something I talk a lot about is reaching its, its sporting potential um, or its potential as a sports nation. So I, when, I, when, I tr when I first came to India, which was 2007, and I came again in 2008, it was just as a, as a, as a backpacker traveling around India. And I was you know, roaming around and going to small villages and small towns and really trying to understand the, the, the nature of this country, which I've, you know, after 10 years now, I'm still, still trying to learn. And I, when I, and I was speaking to as many people as I could about football and, um, you know, the love for football. And what I understood is that at least what, it's not just cricket or not just football, but just the concept of sport. Everyone has a sporting story, you know, every Indian, right. whether they played kabaddi or they're playing Coco or they're playing whatever it might be. There's some connect with sport um, and some love. Of course, when uh, you see our, our national team, especially our cricket team winning World, uh, World Cups, the, it, it, the emotion, it sparks the emotion in a country of 1.3 billion. You can see them dancing on the streets. So I see it from a, from a passion and maybe even slightly a participation to some extent, it's there. From a business perspective in the commercial side, what I have saw in the US is that the US has a way of commercializing and sustaining any sporting 
um, activity, whether it be a rock, paper, scissor World Cup that I was a part of, or you know, a Major League Baseball or an NFL, I mean, or my own little youth soccer that I was playing when I was four years old, AYSO. The US, in the US, we always figured out how to not just you know, love sport from a passion perspective, but really develop sport from a profession in a sustainability. And I think India is very far off. Uh, right now from the professional size. Yeah, from the entire ecosystem. And as a word that I probably overused, ecosystem, and I'm sure my students I, I laugh every time when I, they hear it from my mouth, but I really believe in the concept of not just becoming a champion or building a world-class team. It's about creating a world-class uh, organization, a world-class landscape, and making sure that every aspect of the ecosystem is thriving. And, not just in football, but across all sports in India, and probably even certain aspects of cricket, I don't think we're there yet. It's interesting you mentioned the word ecosystem because that's pretty much my next question, which is, uh, you're somebody who has uh, worked in different roles across the Indian sporting ecosystem. What do you think, can you give us three elements that you think that are critical to building a sustainable sports ecosystem? Absolutely. So the first and foremost, which is um, you know discussed quite quite a lot in this in this institute and in any conversation I have with any investor or potential investor in sports in India is vision and mission. You know, it, it's whether it's a Simon Sinek, the books that I, I love reading, or um, any any like you know whether it's Steve Jobs or. Everyone who's done anything meaningful in sport had, uh, in, in over a longer period of time, or, and not just sport, in, in life, had, had vision and mission. You know, they're clear where they wanted to go and they were clear of, you know, this is what I want to accomplish or this is who we want to be as an organization or as, a, as an industry. And I, I feel that um, and what I've seen from many people who in the industry uh, who've invested, whether from a league perspective, a government perspective, a federation, or even some of the grassroots programs, that vision is sometimes missing, or maybe that vision is there, but it gets lost somewhere along the way. The second part of it is, is, is a business plan, like a, a clear, a sound business plan that aligns with the vision, um, that, that's ready to be able to course correct, where if anything comes up that's external or internal, that's, that's able to course correct. And that's, of course, based on the word you used earlier, sustainability. That is not based on becoming, you know, the, the individual or the entity that everyone loves right off the bat because we've won championships or we've signed um, the biggest names or players right away and now we have access to XYZ um, you know, uh, circles in Bollywood or whatever it might be. But really looking at, we are seen as a group that's professional and sustainable. And I've seen, I've, I think a lot of the business plans that I've seen in this country are missing that. And the third one is, what, the other word I use quite a bit is patience. Right. I can't, stress enough on how important patience is, especially if you believe in your vision and your business plan. And patience, you know, looking at my time at Major League Soccer, in 2002, the league was contracting. We lost uh, Miami Fusion and Tampa Bay Mutiny, or they, they, they shut shop. And there was a lot of other negative things going on around uh, the concept of professional football or soccer in the US. However, the, the owners, the investors, the original people and the architects of Major League Soccer and the people who originally invested, they had a, a 20 year plan. And what you see now in 2019 in the success of Atlanta United, or the success of a Toronto FC or a Seattle Sounders or whether an LA Galaxy, that wasn't just by chance. This was thought about in 1996 and even in 2002 when everything was looking really dark, those individuals who, who who started investing, they, they believed in the, the plan that they had started with and they knew that give it a decade or so and it's gonna get better. Yeah. And sometimes here, I believe because of the success of IPL and cricket, a lot of the other leagues and a lot of the other people who are investing in, in sport want to create either the EPL or IPL overnight and without realizing that it's gonna take a while, especially when, when that particular sport is not the number one sport in the country it might take a you know double whatever to cricket. However, if you build a solid foundation, you'll get there eventually. Right. It's interesting that you meant. I want to pick up on something that you mentioned there, which is there is this um, patience. You said patience is an is, is an important part. You've worked with some of the big uh, corporate houses in the country, right? Uh, and you know, helping them kind of build their sports vision and, like you said, mission. Uh, the Indian gen Indian population in general is very risk averse they, and they and they like to see returns almost immediately. 
how did you find a way to circumvent that need for immediate profit or immediate returns to help these you know big corporate houses build a vision over a course of time so we are quite uh, i guess it was more more opportunistic when with that libero sports we had um, you know come across a number of uh, corporate houses that had been investing in in football for a long right. time right. and all we had to do is spend some time with the owner and understand okay what is his real vision and i i go back to what i said earlier vision is so important and see anybody who's investing any whether it's 1 rupee or you know 10 crores or 100 crore at the end of the day they're doing it for there's some deeper reason yes. and it might be psychological or whatever it might be but um, at the or every human especially somebody who's ready to invest something and and especially if it's a passion project so like for many of them sport there's a reason behind that there was a reason you know it could be um they want to help more young indians achieve um you know uh inter- international standards in terms of their level of play they want to help india win a world cup one day they want to do more for the goan community or they want to do more for the maharashtra com- state of maharashtra or their particular city there was a deeper reason but what ends up happening is that it, it unravels and they hire a number of people um they keep spending they get in kind of a default setting of spend 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 go to go go and they're not they're not really connecting back with that vision so as football consultants all we would do is actually go to the top person Yeah. sit with him or her and try to understand that individual's vision then we would go back to actually hard facts okay you've spent this much money over this many years and at the same time you've achieved this and this but you know try to show that while that spending has happened and while some achievements and some trophies have come up what is the real uh, legacy and impact that they've been able to make and is it sustainable in this particular um particular um, you know method and approach right. and inside of that one is they understood hey these these guys understand me two is that they've understood that um hey you know what whatever i spent so far it could have been spent far better and in right. with far more effectively and three is i think that they could tell me that or we would at least showcase how we can help them start to get closer to achieving his vision in at a much more sustainable um you know way of spending in a much more sustainable way of spending all of that is how we were able to get a number of different business opportunities with existing investors any new investor it wasn't much different we would go back to him or her and try to understand their vision and then we would build a plan based on that and i think one of the things that they appreciate is that typically um when somebody wants to invest in sport they want to go big fast especially if they have the resources so they want to say okay i want to buy a professional team tomorrow or i want to get manchester united as a partner because everyone loves manchester united in india there's 20 million united supporters and what we would say is that okay we could do that we could go out and facilitate a partnership with manchester united or we can help you build your way and get you connected to all india football federation to ensure that you get a corporate entry into the i league but we would say we don't recommend that we recommend that let's focus on the areas that are needed right now whether it's infrastructure or youth development or coaching education programs so he or she would be ready to spend 10 to 15 crores a year through us which means a great commissions great uh, service fees but in but even in spite of that we would still say no right. we don't feel comfortable with this because in a couple of years this will all uh, you'll look back and say how could you allow me to have done this so i think they also appreciated that as well right. once they saw that we are genuine they would allow us to take them on a much more slow and strategic path versus the um you know the path of uh least resistance where you just throw a lot of money but eventually there will be resistance down the line so you worked in the indian football ecosystem you know right right from when like you said it was an afterthought like football was still being played yes but nobody really took it as seriously as they do right now today the product of indian football is worth hundreds of millions of dollars so the obvious tipping point is the introduction of the indian super league it's one of the obvious tipping points there were multiple tipping points of course including our um fairly solid performance at the afc cup yes it was disappointing that we got out but it, it i think it'll be a tipping point in it mm-hmm. so outside of the indian super league what are some of the can you give me maybe one or two non obvious tipping points that helped in the development of football in india mm. so interesting question now um, because i i would say one is the afc licensing criteria oh. afc uh, you know what i i was very happy with the um the fact that all india football federation started to implement the afc licensing criteria when they did i think back in 2012 2013 when it started started getting introduced something that we spend a lot of time with our students 
sharing is what is what are because a lot of our students happen to want to work in professional football one day and, and their pathway to go to glo international football is through India and is with India and I want them to know that you know even when I became a CEO of a professional team and I, I moved to Pune in um, April or May of 2016 you know my uh, the my first two to three months was primarily just ensuring that all the paperwork and documentation was in place so we passed our we, we got the, the, the license for AFC for the upcoming season. Why that's important is that up until now, I-League clubs were able to kind of just get away with putting a team on the pitch and just making sure that they played. And as long as they had, you know, 11 players sitting out there and playing the match, they got to their match on time, mostly, it was okay. And a professional league, and, and the ecosystem can develop. I feel like a, a strong domestic professional league helps all, all levels under it as well and, and above it the national team also benefits right. and but that per, and I saw it with Major League Soccer how much MLS helped the entire US soccer ecosystem we needed a strong domestic professional league structure now of course there's a lot going on with I League and ISL and all that in terms of the future pathway but the fact that AFC licensing criteria was brought in that CEOs and COOs and all that all parts of the each organization had to really think about what is my youth development plan what is my, uh, my CSR plan? What is my marketing plan? And AFF it wasn't just the federation, it was going to AFC. So at some point in the last couple of years, the documents would be vetted by AIFF, but then it would eventually go to AFC. And so we ha it wasn't just, I have a good relationship with those guys in Dorica, I can call them up and say, no, no, no problem, just let that marketing plan go by. <laughs> or I know I, my coach has a B license instead of an A license, it's okay. You can't do that because AFC wasn't looking at every single document. So I thought that that's a that's a big one. Right. Um, I would say number two is we we've start clubs, especially ISL um, clubs, started bringing in sports science. Like we looked at all the ancillary types of um, uh, technical staff that would come in and, and just services like nutritionist and sometimes you know Indra Neil Dasbla was here the other day talking about a sports psychologist and how you know it's important to have them masseuse. Now, in the past, if you're spending 10 to 15 crore a year for an Eyes and Eye League club, or say you're spending even 5 to 10 crore, and there's literally no guarantee it's coming back, and typically you have an Indian coach or you might have a foreign coach, but he, 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 may, he may demand a lot of that, but Eye League owners were not ready to spend on all of these right. backroom staff. All of a sudden, ISL starts and you need to have a marquee coach. And those marquee coaches, they expect a certain level of backroom staff right. that comes with him. And while it, it is an extra cost and there's no guarantee you're making that money back anytime soon, but what it did is it started teaching a lot of our Indian coaches the importance of having this. Now, they might have known it as well, but it's not just the coaches, it's the CEOs, the CEOs, it's the, the owners, where they see that you know, having a really a solid nutritionist, having a solid masseuse, having a solid uh, psychologist around or physiotherapist or having multiple physiotherapists why that's good in terms of the, the growth of these players, especially the younger players, and even the growth, their, their stability in their mind, that was extremely important. And it feeds into something that I saw that was lacking right when I moved here, was you, know, you look at our, our academies, our top academies, when I moved here in 2009, that, that environment that demands excellence was missing. Yes. So even in the US, if you go to a good football academy when you're 14, which is a very critical time, or 13, which is a very critical time of your life, that environment demanded excellence 24 hours, how you're sleeping, how you're speaking, what you're reading, how much you're on the phone, um, you know, what, if you're late to be on the pitch, what happens to you, what is the policies there, are you allowed to wear a hat um, for lunch, all of those things help breed, help you reach your full potential as a player. When I went to Tata Football Academy, nothing to take away from it, it's an amazing place, right. but I saw that if that's our best academy in the country and that's producing at that time 121 national team players I feel like we're going to struggle to achieve the same standards that the other countries that we're competing against have because I'm sure many of their best academies have a far level a higher level of um, you know um, professionalism and, and what they're demanding from the players coaches staff everyone is at a much different level than where we're at in India I think now because we're bringing in some foreigners but also our Indian coaches are evolving at a fast pace that environment is much more professional than it ever was before and you're starting to see with our, our success we're having with our u16s our u17s and so on right 
I, I and I completely agree with you there. Like we were just discussing a few minutes earlier uh, before the recording, which is that there are certain organizations, sports organizations, that in India where the only thing lacking is a certain amount of standardiz standardization of practices and professionalism because they've got everything else sorted, right? And Tata Football Academy in those about eight, eight years ago was, was a prime example of that. They, they had the talent, they had the infrastructure, they had the will, they had the, they had the guts, yeah. they, they had everything sorted. But if they had just managed to, for example, bring in this professionalism which has come in now, maybe 10 years ago, we would have been in a very different place. And Literally, professionalism for most, for a lot of sports organizations in India, isn't just one of the things they have to do. Literally, it's the if they do that, it's the only thing that is left for them to do, and automatically it's an uptick in their growth. You know, you're, you're, you're completely right, and I think um, you know we and it's and it and I get it. It's and it's so easy for you and I, and this is nothing taking away from what you just said or what I just said, but it's very easy for you and I to sit in this nice you know boardroom and kind of talk about professionalism when you're actually out there on the pitch or with with your teams as a ceo or ceo or an owner it's far different because um the understanding of what professionalism is in a football club is is completely it's 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 it varies from individual to individual that's why it's so important for that owner and eventually that ceo to set that tone of what is expected across the board um what is professionalism one of the things that we used to do at uh, DSK, we had a very strong partnership with Liverpool Football Club. Yes. And, you know, in the early days, we used to, you know, take trips over to uh, the, their academy in Liverpool. And, you know, they, of course, they would show us, um, you know, their, their trainings and they would kind of talk to us about their org chart and, and all that, which was great. And they would take us to Anfield and we'd see a match and talk to them about marketing and, and operations and all. But then later I realized that, you know what, whatever we're learning and then we come back, it's almost impossible to implement in our current, ecosystem, our current, our current structure. So the next trips that we took, we eventually took some of our coaches and we asked them completely different things. We said, okay, if you're releasing a player at the academy, how do you speak to that player? Who meets with that player? Does it, is it the, the, his coach? Is it the academy director? Is it both? Is it the, somebody on the admin side? How do you release that player? If you're inducting a player in, what is his process that he goes through to be properly inducted? Um, if there's a fight on the pitch between players, how do you even manage that? Do you jump right in or do you let them fight it out for a bit? Do you, how do you discipline them? What are the, so these are things that whatever is happening in a professional uh, environment like the Liverpool Academy, I would, it's all those soft skills and soft approaches that I actually can implement here in India. And those are the things that we learned a tremendous amount from international organizations. See, just taking, you know, a, a technical and tactical plan from Manchester United or Liverpool or Barcelona. Yeah, you can learn a lot, but to actually say, okay, here you go, Indian coaches, implement this now. This is our new style. It, it makes zero sense. But these types of more, I mean, it's all in the details. If right. the details are there, you know, what kind of reading materials are on the, uh, in the clubhouse? Um, you know, when a, when a, when a player is, uh, is, what kind of player policies do you put in place to ensure that you're not limiting who, their self-expression, but at the same time you're creating a sense of discipline there on the campus. All of that's extremely important. And we, um, we can learn a lot from internationals from that, right. rather than just cutting and pasting, uh, copying and pasting and saying, okay, this is the new way, which obviously has, we all realize now it doesn't work. One of the things most critics of, of, of sports management say is, isn't sports management just management in sport, right? You just learn management and you use it in sport. Uh, so why, what is, what is the need for a sports specific degree or a certificate or a, or a course for that matter? I would say there's no need for a degree. There's not even a need for a course technically. Um, See, a course and a degree is, is nice to have, but it doesn't necessarily make you a better sports management professional. What's, what's required is, and it's like any industry, if you wanna get into an industry, whether it's medicine or law, yes, of course you need some sort of certificate. Yes, you need to go through some course, but the reality is what, what are you doing to get that? Um, you're, you're getting experience. You're, you're learning different aspects of the industry. Now, it's a catch-22 in sport. Because it's it's difficult to get industry experience without um, 
you know, having some industry experience. <laughs> like if somebody comes to you, in the in sport is one of these these industries that you know everyone. So many people love sport. They're connected to sport. They would dream of working in sport. So the demand out there is, uh, or the supply is quite high of of people who would love to work in sport, and right. the, the the demand is quite low because there's only so many positions, especially in a growing sporting nation like India. But what ends up happening is that if I'm somebody out there who wants to get a job in sport and I'm somebody here as an employer looking to hire somebody who wants to work in sport, but I would still like that individual to have some sort of experience, some sort of basic knowledge because I don't want to pay him or her just to learn. Right. I need him or her to be able to contribute because right. we're, we, we want to grow fast. And uh, so what, what a course does is it gives you, it's a platform basically. And, and a, lot of other, a lot of times also is that you know, a lot of when you ask somebody who's, who's you know, it doesn't have to be young, you could be anybody saying, what do you want to do in sport? Okay, you love sport. Great. You love football, you love basketball, you love cricket, you play national level. That's all great. Now you want to work in sport. Fine. What do you want to do in sport? Nine times out of 10, that answer is like, I, I don't know. Exactly. I don't know the industry. I don't know what to do. I don't, I don't know. Which is fine too. But then I don't want to hire somebody who wants to figure out what they want to do in sport my, on, my on my dime or even on my time. Like, even if they're an intern, they're going to, they're taking up space, which is vital, um, you know, real estate right. that somebody else could take up. So it just, and if they're taking it up just to learn and figure things out and tinker around, that doesn't work for me either. Right. And most people would say that in, as an employer. So then what does, what a course does, is it's a platform. It, it's, it's almost a time. It's a piece of, it's time. It's 12 months, it's 24 months, it's 15 months, whatever it is for you to kind of meet different people in the industry. Get to know yourself better as well. Start to do a, a few internships. Maybe you hate some, maybe you love some, but then by the end of it, you start to become more clear on who you are and where you want to go. And, and then it becomes much easier for an employer to say, okay, great. You, the, you're, you clearly want to do digital marketing for a football club, or you want to be in the CSR area, or you want to do operations or analytics. No problem. We have an opportunity here and for you to kind of jump in. So the course is important for, to kind of start to hone and you know, become more clear on your skills, come more clear on your aspirations, and more clear also on basically how the industry operates. I, I mean, ultimately, you're going to learn when you get the job. Right, but um, you're going to get a, a much better sense than just somebody watching Manchester United games from a couch or playing football or playing cricket. And then to know what it's like to work in cricket is very different. So at least it gives you about 12 to 24 months of ex of. A, a, a couple of different touch points before you get into the industry. Right. I mean, in a in a in a in a way, in a very in a very um, stretchy way, it's like a gap here, right? Yeah. Like you you yeah. are still you're still building your skills to understand which direction you want to go in, and it's important to figure out which direction which direction you want to go in, as opposed to how hard you're going in that direction. Yeah. So, um, even yeah. even me, I, mean, I I knew from 16 years old in 1996 when MLS started, I was 100 percent sure that I wanted to work for Major League Soccer when I was 22. 100 percent sure. I was the only, and I only wanted one job. I wanted the job of in fan development. I wanted to work basically somebody who goes out and and, and develops fans and develops more connect um, in the community for Major League Soccer. That was it. And I was one of those lucky people who kind of knew all that. Now. At Seton Hall, I, I ended up doing my MBA at Seton Hall University. Right. Why? Because I, at the end, ultimately, I was still a, uh, a 21 year old in California, UC Santa Barbara, and I wanted a job at MLS in New York City. And I would write to them, I'd call them, I was trying any way to get in. However, um, what getting my MBA in sports management did is it, I chose a place that's near New York City, in New, North New Jersey, and it gave me one year to essentially be there closer, building my knowledge until they eventually hired me as an right. intern, which they did. If I just tried to jump from California, a guy who's really passionate, who wanted something badly, to a job in New York City, it may not have happened. And then I would have just taken another job if I didn't get my education. So it gave me, like you exactly said, a gap year right. to just be closer physically and geographically to uh, the place I want to be. And then from an education perspective, it gave me a lot more knowledge to be better at that job. So I was really glad that I, I ended up taking that path. And that's what opportunity here for a lot of young Indians as well. So you had mentioned, you had mentioned earlier, and we've, met, we've, we've spoken about GISP before. What makes GISP unique? Because there are, a, there are a bunch of institutions already offering sports management courses, right? Or degrees for that matter. So what makes GISP unique? GISP is Global Institute of Sports, Sport sports Business. Sports Business, yes. Sports business. <laughs> Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. number of things, um, and it was it was created based on the idea that 
you know, a lot of our experiences that we've had um, in our professional lives, myself and a number of other individuals in the industry, uh, both globally and, and domestically, that recognize the, the need for an industry design sports management course here in India. Now, it came from, for the last, I've been now in India almost nearly 10 years. And in those 10 years, in the first couple of years, I would, of course, get many people who are uh, connected, who would connect people in their lives to me or people who just find me and say, you know, ask me questions. Okay, well, I, I love sport. I want to work in sport. I'd love to follow in your footsteps and, and work in professional football or, or some other aspect of the industry. What should I do? And at that time, there weren't a lot of jobs in the country. And it was hard to kind of recommend to go pursue that particular organization. So I would always ask, if you have the means and, the, um, and you're ready to, go, go abroad and, and study and get your d degree. In that time, hopefully the industry will start to develop. You'll right. make some contacts out there. Maybe you get a job over there. And there you go. And then many people went. And um, in the meantime, there was some programs starting here in India. And they're all fine. Like, I've been able to be associated with many of them. And I've been, you know, in, I've enjoyed my experiences uh, in their, those campuses. But what I've seen is that there's a challenge for individuals who choose both paths. The one that's studying here in India and, or going abroad. The ones who are going abroad are spending a lot of money, of course. And, and they're getting exposure, experience, whatever maturity comes with living abroad. However, at the same time, you know, right now getting a job in, in Europe or US or uh, Australia in sports, it was never easy before, but with a lot of government policies happening at the government level across in each of these continents, it's getting harder and harder. And um, so those, a lot of times those indiv individuals come back and they're sitting in front of myself or many other employers in the industry. And whatever they've learned, it's not really re it's not relevant to India. And exactly. Jonathan, you've been in India for a long time. We, you know, we've both been in this in working in sports and working in journalism and, and media for many years. And you've seen that there's so many uh, idiosyncrasies about the you know just working in India in various in industries right. <laughs> in the ecosystem here that you might have been in these fantastic internships over there, but then you come here and try to translate a lot of that over here, and it just doesn't work. And so. And also just the price point I mean, the salary expectations and everything else, it's hard to show an ROI based on what they spent. And it becomes difficult for somebody in our, in our shoes. Then you translate, you go over the people who are in India getting their degrees. And unfortunately, many of those programs are very, they're a bit more academic focused versus industry focused. So sometimes after a year or two years of doing a program, I don't think those individuals are, are much more attractive to the employer than before. And it's right. just, it's, a, it's an industry where the degree, whether it's an MBA or master's or diploma or certificate, it's not going to immediately get that job. It's going to be more about who you know, how you, how you, what you know about the industry, how you can present yourself. What makes GIS be different is that it's first off, and th the reason why anybody does any of these programs is ultimately to get a job. They want to work in the industry. And as we said earlier, this is an a platform for them to get into the industry. GISB was designed by the industry to basically serve the industry, meaning that we want to nurture our students in a way that's gonna make them the most attractive for us and most effective when in, to be able to contribute to the sports industry organizations. So how do you do that? One, is that you hire, you, you, just the way you hire right people, we, take, we give admissions or we offer admissions to only people whose why is very clear. Right. My interviews, and I've had a lot of interviews here on this table, is that you, we, I, I'm, I'm, not just, I'm not looking for the most intelligent right off the bat. I'm not looking for the guy who comes from the business house family who has you know, loads of money. I'm looking for that why. If they're pretty clear, and they don't need to know exactly what they want to do in sport, they just need to know why they want to be studying sport and work in the industry. So we, we have a great batch in our first batch, and I know that um, if we continue on this path of asking the why and trying to be honed in, we'll be there. Two is that we provide them with as much industry exposure as possible. Our faculty are all visiting faculty that come in for multiple days. And these are all individuals with anywhere from 10 to 25 years experience right. working in sport. Because right. just working in a marketing position for two to three years, especially in a country like India that it's evolving over all the time, it's hard to say that you're either an expert or highly knowledgeable in that field. I want people who've gone through a generation who pioneered particular parts of the industry. Exactly. People like Joy Bhattacharya, people like Sukhvinder Singh, you know, people like Gaurav Madhava. People who really understand kind of the different aspects of the ecosystem and how to capitalize on the gaps in the market. They're the ones who are teaching our courses. To, beyond that, we spend a lot of time out of the office interacting with the industry and office visits and so on. 
Um, we go to U uh, Europe and we spend some time in England with the Premier League and understand how they run their businesses. So that's, that's uh, another aspect. So the industry engagement. Third, what I love, which is very much um, a part of kind of my own success in life, has been we spend a lot of time on self-development. So the first two month, months is just uh, foundation. And those two months is all about communication skills. It's all about neuro-linguistic programming, your own mindset and limiting belief systems. We do acting classes so the students can open up and express themselves better. We do something called self-discovery. They're figuring out their passion, their purpose, and their strengths and how it aligns with the industry. We spend a lot of time on Microsoft Office just making sure those basic skills of PowerPoint, Excel, and Word are, are clear so they walk into an office one day and they can, can properly present something or properly do, do, you know, create an Excel budget, chart or yeah. budget or whatever yeah. it might be. And then we, we, we teach them storytelling. And see, ultimately, when you hire somebody, you're hiring the individual. You know, Indra Neil Daspla told a story about you the other day in our, in our, well, during his guest lecture. And he talked about the, how great you were, you were, how hungry you were, and how in terms of you really wanted to be in the industry and you're ready to take certain risks. Why? Because you believed in yourself, you knew that this is what you want, you're willing to take those kind of risks to fulfill some aspiration that you had. You know, sometimes in education system, especially with the communities we live in in India, we get filled with so much information to take the, the very conservative road to success in life. And inside of that, we miss out on these really beautiful opportunities that exist out there. We're helping our students unlearn some of that stuff so they can become more connected to who they are. And once they're, once they're connected to who they are, then it's just about you to, using their own communication skills to be able to go create something for themselves out there in the industry. And I think most people who've been successful in, in sport or probably in life have been able to create pave their own path. Exactly. It's not a path that's been given and then they followed A, B, C, D. It's that they saw who they are and where they want to go and they found a way to make it happen no matter what external challenges existed. Right. We spend a lot of our time with our students on that. I'd say the fourth main thing is, goes back to the Industry Connect. India on Track is a, is a national sports management and marketing company. We have over 100 employees across six verticals. So this campus is actually set inside of our, our India on Track Mumbai office. And many of our students would love to work in a, in, in a company like this. We work with La Liga and Premier League and NBA and Prakash Padako and Badminton and many other things. And so because uh, you know, every day they're constantly exposed to what's happening in the industry, there's people coming in here for meetings that our students can sit in on sometimes. They're constantly meeting the employees of India on Track. It helps them understand what it is to work in the industry far better than anybody sitting in a college campus that's kind of still disconnected. They're getting daily industry experience You're just by, by the nature of being on this campus. I think we spoke, we, we covered quite a, quite a few topics here, Neil. I kind of want to wrap this up by asking you a question, which is moving forward. I mean, India, India is now an evolving uh, sporting country, right? Uh, moving forward, if you if you had a wish list, what would be the top two things uh, you'd like to see in terms of India growing towards or continuing to develop as a sporting country? Two things that you would like to see personally change. Yeah, um, more programs like GISB and for, for students at a younger age as well, for high school. Uh, I was just speaking to UMass uh, Amherst, somebody there, and they do a number of these high school uh, immersion, sports management immersions career immersions for high school students. And um, see, we, we mentioned professionalism so many times, you know, during this talk as well. And, and you know, professionalism is not something you can teach overnight. It's something that's developed through mentor, good mentors, through exposure, through getting to know yourself. And, you know, the more professionals we have in the you know, sports industry here in India, we'll start to see this industry blossom um, right. and, and start to actually achieve its potential, which is what we, talk, we started this, this, you know, this chat about. I would like to, to I, I would love to see 20, 30, 40 more GISB type in, um, institutes come up over the next 10 to 15 years. I, it, it will, I, I'm, I'm really, um, you know, bringing, I want competition to come on fully right. because this is, this is, we all, I mean, we were doing this not to make money, we're doing this to build uh, you know, professionalize and build a, a strong sporting ecosystem that we're all proud of and that we, all, that we can all grow into and thrive into. So that's one is professionalism. Two is, is I can't talk about it enough patience and um, it comes with being professional but I would like to see whether it's this new pro volleyball league which I'm so happy that uh, our good friend Joy has uh, established and 
you know, he's doing it in a, in a he has six teams in his first, um, first league or first year. And I think that's fantastic. Right. And he's picking two cities and he's keeping the, the budgets low. That's completely fine. You don't need to have 20 teams. You don't need to have budgets of 15 crore uh, uh, French for franchise fees right off the bat. You right. can, right. but you don't need to. It's right. okay to start small. Major League Stalker started with, I think, 10 clubs owned by three owners. Three owners on 10 teams. And it was okay. People laughed at it. They said, how could you call yourself a professional league? How could you? But the reality is that was the only way they can get going. And they needed to get going and build trust, build confidence and build up. I'm 100% sure professional football can thrive, not just on the pitch, but off the pitch as well. It can thrive here. I think the way that Kabaddi is starting to build, many other leagues can come and they won't and not go away a couple of years later like we've seen over the last decade. Right. We can build this into what you see in the US. And I always say in India, things that sometimes take uh, two minutes can take 20 years, but sometimes things that take 20 years in another country can take two minutes in India. It, right. it can happen very fast with the right type of uh, alignment with all the stakeholders. And that's what excites me, that's what keeps me here, is that I've seen so many things fail, but I've also seen a lot of things that we couldn't even imagine work. Exactly. And, and that's what excites me, is that with the right individuals and the more professionals we have here, and the more patience and strategic thinking and everything else, and courage or whatever it might be, man, we can, we can create miracles in this country. And that's beautiful. And I feel like in India, more than almost any other part of the world, this is, this is possible. And um, yeah, and so that's what it is, I'd say, patience and more education around sports management careers and building more sports professionals at a younger age. If we have those two things, this thing is going to skyrocket. Great. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Neil. Uh, always, you're, you're always generous with your time, especially when I call you, when I, when I check in on you and obviously for now the podcast. I hope this is not the last time we have you on. I hope you, hope you come on uh, more often. Uh, thank you for all you do for the Indian sports industry and best of luck with the JISP and moving ahead. Wonderful. Thank you, Jonathan. I love Nation of Sport. love reading your articles and listening to your podcast and you're a fantastic professional to have in the industry and keep doing what you're doing. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. See you. Thank you.